Okie doke. Thanks, guys, for that. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, I'm going to introduce Susan, Suzanne, and Carl Hines, who are going to talk to us about POTA today. Uh, I just want to add that parts of POTA have been explained before by... I've, I've been to a couple different events. Carl Hines, Susan have been to some of them, and it's just really been a good time. And part of the reason it's a good time is because they're so good at explaining this stuff and making it seem easy so that when you go and do parks somewhere or when you're working from home and you're talking to parks, you know what you're doing and it's not hard and it can be a lot of fun. So let us all know for the people who haven't seen it before and the updates. I know there's some new stuff. Thanks, Tim. Just to set the expectations here for the night, this is a team presentation because there's, it's so fun and we were fighting over who got to talk about what, so we're all doing it. But our, our other POTA, POTA partner, unfortunately, is at work, Rich, Kilo Delta 2 UBJ, which I have written on my piece of paper, Rich, because you know I can never remember it. And I see other POTA lovers out here today, too. So, And I just met another POTA lover, Dwayne, a new member, with over 600 contacts. So anyway, this is a team presentation, and we all have notes, because if we didn't have notes, we would be here until 10 o'clock. So bear with us as we shuffle and move around through our notes. So I'm Susan, W2SBA. I was licensed in 2020. That was my um, pandemic project. Instead of learning piano or Latin, I, got, I did this, and I have my general license. I got them back to back two months apart. Suzanne Bishop is W2SUZ, and she got, <laughs> in one month in 2021, at the same testing, she got burned right through her tech and is a general. And of course, Carl Heinz Kramer, everybody knows the education POTA guy, 1994. So um, today's presentation is about the Parks on the Air, or POTA program. Rara did, Carl Heinz, Rara did the last um, presentation back in 2020. It was the second to the last meeting before everything shut down. And it was at the Pittsburgh Community Center. Um, the program has changed a bit since then, but a lot has remained the same. The three of us combined have more than 36,000 POTA CUSOs working about 6,000 unique parks and attempting, more about that later, attempting more than 670 activations. And one of us is the POTA mapping coordinator for New York. And another one of us just activated their 100th park. So we've got a lot of experience with this. We're a little obsessed. And so I know other people out here are obsessed. OK, so this is a lot. The machine, the man, OK. I moved it. I got it. Thank you. OK, so I asked. I asked Carl Heinz, who was fine? Who is this guy fine? Well, apparently, fine is not a person. It's just read the manual. So we can't explain every detail of the POTA program because we only have an hour. But all the answers that you're looking for are in the manual on the POTA website. There's a good chance that every question that you might come up with is already answered in this document. If there's something that you still can't find, then the POTA helpline at help at parksontheair.com should be able to help you answer your question. Keep in mind, everybody in the POTA program is a volunteer. So look for the answers in the manual, if you can, before um, you check with the volunteer. So today, what we're going to talk about, um, this will be an introduction to those of you who have not yet heard about POTA, and a reminder of a few important things for those of you who have been hunting or even activating. We'll cover both the hunter and activator roles. We'll talk about how to activate a park. And there'll be some general remarks about portable operations. We'll talk, touch on gear that you might need. And we'll finish the evening talking about some of our most notable activations. So I'm going to turn it over to Carl Hines. So. Oh, I have to give you yeah, I need the microphone. Uh, I, I think most people here actually know what RTFM means, so 
I don't think we have to explain the fine. <laughs> so uh, when you look around the ham radio world, you find a lot of different on-the-air programs. Some of them are more familiar, like Summits on the Air, Soda, or Islands on the Air, IOTA, but there are a lot of pretty obscure programs, and the Brits are actually pretty good at coming up with new stuff. Just the other day, I heard about Bunkers on the Air. Sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so uh, why do we need another, some location or some place on the Air? Because we needed something to save ham radio. Uh, and with a little bit tongue-in-cheek, I think uh, Poda actually saved ham radio. When I got back into ham radio six years or so ago, um, this was before Poda really took off, a lot of times the bands were really empty and you could spin that dial for hours and not hear anybody. Nowadays, when you... Uh, listen to uh, the bands, there's a good chance that you find 50 Poda stations on at any given time on a regular weekday. Uh, when I checked the spotter this morning, there were 60 spots for parks on the air. On weekends, it's usually 100 or even more. And this is not uh, daily totals. This is at any given time. You look at the spotter, you see 50, 60, 70 spots there during daytime hours. So um, we brought a lot of activity to the ham radio bands with Poda. Uh, the other thing is that the Poda, pro the Poda program is also a lot more diverse than all the other niches in ham radio. You see this here. We have two women here, um, and this is pretty standard for Poda. You find a lot more women in our program than anywhere else on ham radio. People who left ham radio come back to operating because of Poda. Some people join ham radio because of Poda. So this is why I'm saying, again with tongue in cheek, that Poda is the program that saved ham radio. If you think that you are not making enough contacts, that there is not enough going on on the bands, just look at the Poda spotter at poda.app and start working down that list. And there's a good pretty good chance you will have way more to work than you ever wanted to. So <clears throat> uh, if we look at the history of the POTA program, um, it all goes back to 2016 when the ARL did their National Parks on the Air or NPOTA program and everybody loved it. People loved going to national parks. Back then it was just national parks and operating from them. And the people at home loved hunting these national parks. And then the year ended and everybody was bored because there was nothing more to do. Um, the NPODA program ended, so uh, a few people who were heavily into NPODA got together and created the PODA Parks on the Air program. Um, by setting up the database, setting up the website, defining the rules of the program, and then just launching it. And it started really small, but then it took off. Just on a side note, when you research Parks on the Air, you may come across a program called WWFF, the Worldwide Flora and Fauna Program. It caters to a similar need, but is completely separate from Poda. And it's, at least that's my opinion, it's uh, more strongly represented in other parts of the world, not here in the U.S. So it started with this small group of U.S.-based volunteers that set everything up, and then eventually they added other volunteers, and this is where I come in as the New York uh, mapping coordinator for PODA. So there are a lot of volunteer positions in the PODA program that makes this work. Add a complete rewrite of the website, and that is where we are today. Um, we have a large number of entities of references in the PODA program and a short list of rules. 
note I'm saying references or entities because not every park is actually a park. There are national uh, and state forests, there are wildlife management areas, historic sites. In New York State, we have unique areas and multi-use areas. Every state has their strange way of naming these things. So there's a lot more than parks in the program. But just to make things easy, we'll just refer to these things as park. But from now on, you know that a park is not necessarily actually a park. And this is where I'm turning it over to Suzanne. Susan, please. Oh. Susan. That's Suzanne and Susan. Um, okay. So there are, today, there are over 36,000 registered users from all over the world. When Carl Heinz did this presentation in January of 2020, there were 3,300. 36,000 today. That's more than tenfold. It's growing like crazy. Um, in addition to the US, the program is active in 130 DX and entities. Yes, you can qualify for DXCC just by working Poda Parks. I just want you to take a look at this map. This map is, how long, how old do you think it is? This is three years old. Okay. The, the Poda site no longer um, publishes this map. So three years ago, 10 times smaller program, that's how many parks were in the US. Um, but if we zero in a little bit, we all know what that big green hole is, right? Our favorite park. What's its number? Hey, 2001. They all have a number. Every park has a number. That's our favorite. So if you're anywhere in that big giant green air spot, you're in Park K 2001. So this is what the map looks like today. Um, talked about that. Oh, the size of the Adirondack Park, I just wanted to mention. It's larger than the two national parks combined. That would be Death Valley and Yellowstone. And you can even throw in the Great Smoky Mountains. And our, our personal park is bigger. So you can see. Every one of these yellow dots is a POTA entity. They are everywhere. Like, you turn around and there they are. I think the closest ones to us, Lock 30, what is it? Lock 32. Lock 32 um, down by Seabreeze, that little park by Bill Gray's. Round Quite Marine. Other close ones? Braddock's Bay, Hamlin, yep, yep. Scottsville, oh, within the Erie Canal, 6532. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Suzanne. So there's two ways of, of playing POTA. There's the activator, which that person goes out and activates from a park or operates from a park. And then there's the hunter, or some people call it the chaser. And they uh, spin the dial and work the park from a different location, mostly from home, sometimes from other parks. So hunting is very straightforward. You find somebody in a park by spinning the dial on your radio and have a QSO. That's it. There is no logging in the hunter. For the hunter, the, the, you can log in your normal station logbook, but you do not have to log for POTA. Only the activators log, and that's how you, as a, as a hunter, get credit. As a hunter, you don't even have to sign up for an account on the POTA website, but when you do, you can get credit for your hunted parks and earn award certificates. There are ways to find POTA parks without having to scan the bands. The POTA spotter is probably the best method to see who is out there, but you can also use the Slack application to get notifications about activations, or you can get alerts through hamalert.org, which allows you to create very detailed criteria for your alerts. And let me tell you, you want to put that detail in there, because if you don't, you'll get driven nuts. Here's a quick note. We are not on FM repeaters. 
So please use phonetics when you give your call. And please follow the DX Code of Conduct. If you have not read up on it lately, uh, please do so before you hunt your next park, because when I listen to some of the pileups, I know that a lot of hunters could use a refresher on that document. Now we are going to cover the, now that we've covered the hunter role, let's talk about what you need to activate. To activate, you need to be signed up for an account on the POTA website. And other than that, all you need is, of course, a ham radio license. Any license will do. But you have to stay within your limits of your license. You know who I'm talking to. <laughs> There are people who activate parks on 10 meters, SSB, and some who activate on VHF and UHF, but it is much harder than when you have access to all the frequencies that a general license allows you to have. You can use any radio, and there is a good chance that you can drag your shack radio out into a park and successfully use it to activate. You need some antenna. Any kind of antenna will do. Anything that you can deploy in a park. And you need some power, of course, to run it. In order to get credit, you need to submit an ADIF or ADIF log by uploading that ADIF log to the POTA website. You do it all on your own. Here is another important rule. All equipment must be within the park boundaries. Don't trust the online map. You need to find out where the park ends. If there is somebody at the gate collecting your money, then that's a very simple way to find out where you need to be. At other times, check the park-specific information from the state's park department. Here's a handy-dandy map. And the green area is the park. Notice that there's some places in there that are not green. Don't go there. Then you're not in the park. Must stay in the green. Back to me. A little more information on... Um, activating a POTA entity. So to get credit for the activation within the POTA app in the system, you have to make at least 10 simplex QSOs on one UTC day while inside the boundaries of the park on any band that your privileges permit. POTA recommends operating in the general portions of the bands, but it has no specific calling frequencies. There's no specific exchange besides the call sign, but it's pretty typical to ask for a signal report and the state that you're operating in. So in your log, you, you indicate the date, the time, the band, and the mode in any logger program that will export to the ADIF file. Then you upload the log to the POTA website, and that's it. Um, there are POTA-specific logging apps, but you can use any software that allows you to generate the ADIF file. For short activations, you can even use a simplex editor that is built into the POTA website to upload your log. Actually, all of us log in the field by hand with a pen and paper. Um, lots of people use their phones, their computers, tablets, um, everybody wants to do, do it differently. Um, you, part of POTA etiquette is submitting a log, even if you did not get 10 contacts. It happens. Um, your hunters did their job. They were home hunting you or in another park hunting you, and they should get credit for that in their stats. When we look at somebody's POTA stats and they don't show any unsuccessful activations, we assume that they're lying or not trying hard enough or they're just learning. Um, we're proud of every one of our failed activations. Not that there are that many, but they're there. Um, because we know that we learned something from every one of them. It could have been a solar or a geomagnetic storms. It could be weather or you left that important piece of equipment at home you just don't know why, why that might be. Back to Suzanne. Why would you want to activate? Or should I rephrase it, why would you want to work portable? 
If you think back to last month's presentation, we heard about restri restrictions to install outdoor antennas. A lot of us have to live with such restrictions. POTA is an easy way to move your shack into woods, literally. You usually have a much lower, lower noise floor when in a park environment, and often that is uh, combined with a beautiful view and the opportunity to watch wildlife. Every activation has different challenges, terrain, space constraints, weather, accessibility, going out, to be, going out and being challenged by different scenarios will help us to both perfect our POTA kit and also to sharpen our operating skills. You will make friends all over the world. Other operators will know your call sign even if you never met them. And next time at Hamvention, you can greet them as friends. You become the DX. You, yep, you need to go. You don't need to go far away. All you have to do is go to a poda park, call CQ, and that usually creates a pileup. If you've never experienced it, it's quite a thrill. And of course, for those who collect wallpaper, like me, you can earn poda awards. Sure, you can show this. My newest award. Ta-da. <laughs> 100 unique references called the Arizona Agave, <laughs> the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid Award was awarded to Suzanne for submitting proof of working 1,000 unique reference areas. They are very creative. And the Lion Award submitted proof of 12 radar transitions. That was amazing that day, during a 24-hour period. 12, activating 12 different parks, operating from 12 different parks in one day. Yeah. I like awards. <laughs> to activate, just pick a good spot anywhere within the park's boundaries and start to operate. There are, there are of course, better, way, better spots than others. It's up to you to figure out where your signal will work best for you. If you can com combine that perfect spot for propagation with the perfect spot to put up your antenna with a beautiful view, you've hit the jackpot. Some of our parks are more, are more park-like than others. Who knew that you could activate the Empire State Trail all the way down to the tip of Manhattan? This, of course, does not necessarily provide that low noise floor we were trying to sell you earlier, but this is Carl Hines activating on the Hudson River in Manhattan on CW because of that big city noise level. The program, the POTA program is extremely generous and creative with its awards, as you saw earlier. Some say, even if you sneeze, you might get an award. <laughs> but seriously, <laughs> there are so, so many cat award categories that you can pick and choose what you are trying to work on. You start collecting awards by hunting 10 parks or activating 10 parks. And then the awards start rolling in as you increase your numbers. Some of us don't have any easy way to travel around and are stuck activating the same park over and over and over again. But you still earn awards for that, like the Repeat Offender or the Kilo Award, which is an award that you get for making a thousand contacts in the same park. You can earn awards for working the same operator at least 50 times. And you can work all entities within a state or a country. Whatever you like to do, keep on doing it and you will get an award. So when you read this slide, so what radio antenna and battery do I need? This is a question that you will find probably several times every single day on the POTA Facebook group. Um, and sometimes religious wars are getting started about the right or the wrong answer. Um, in my opinion, the only correct answer is just use whatever you already have because there's a pretty good chance when you drag that stuff out into a park and make it work, first of all, it will work, 
but you will also learn a lot about your equipment and about different operating situations that may not be suited perfectly to that equipment that you have, but you can make it work. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about what equipment, I can go in a bit more detail here. Um, a smaller radio will usually provide for faster setup. A boat anchor will work, maybe not in every situation. When you try to do an island with your kayak and a boat anchor, that boat anchor may actually turn into a literal boat anchor. So be careful with that. QRP does work, but it's not something that I would recommend for your first activation unless you are a seasoned QRP operator or you have a pretty high threshold for pain. And I know what I'm talking about because I started my product career with QRP and I had four unsuccessful operations or activations before I got the hang of it and figured out what I needed to do and how I needed to operate. Again, Drag whatever you have out in the field. You will learn and you will eventually be successful. Maybe not on your first attempt, but eventually it will work. Um, so again, if you can find the power to run it, your boat anchor will work as well. If you're at a campsite with a hookup or at a shelter or a lodge with an electric outlet, then that's certainly a possibility. For most people running on other power sources, uh, will usually limit what they want to bring. Um, meaning, if you run off battery, then you don't want a, a radio that wastes energy uh, by creating heat with some nice glowy tubes. Um, so use something that is a little bit more energy efficient and um, it will work for you. On the other end of the spectrum, we have, of course, QRP radios that were specifically designed for low power consumptions, like the mountain topper CW radios or something like that. Um, if you go out, I highly recommend that you keep a checklist of what you need to bring so that you don't end up in a park a few hundred miles away from your kitchen counter where you le left that one adapter without which you cannot run your radio, just because the dog needed to be let out on your way out or you needed to feed the dog or something like that. Use that checklist and make sure that you have everything with you. Uh, bring some spare fuses. Even if you have everything else in your kit, uh, but no spare fuse, your radio will very likely not work with, very well when that fuse blows. Here is a tip. If you need to replace something in the field, um, most truck stops actually carry some ZB radio gear. And they use the same type of coax that we use. They have the same coax adapters that we use. And there's a pretty good chance if this is what's failing you, you might be able to replace it at a truck stop. Going out to the Waterloo exit, for example, there are two truck stops there. Um, and they do have CB gear. Here is another tip. To avoid disasters, bring a duplicate of everything. And I'm not kidding here. Uh, when I go out to a place that requires a lot of driving, then I usually have two radios with me. I have at least two antennas, usually more, because they weigh almost nothing. It's just a piece of wire. And I have plenty of coax, so not just one piece, but several pieces that I can either uh, connect together to make a longer run or replace one if it breaks. And that does happen because whatever you take out in the field breaks a lot earlier than it would break in your shack. Okay, this covers the radio. Let's talk about the antennas. Sometimes your antenna choice will be limited by where you are trying to operate from because of site restrictions. Historic sites, for example, don't usually allow you to dig some dig into in the ground. So stakes or something like that are a no-no uh, because there might be bullets in there or bones. You never know. 
Um, uh, another restriction is um, nature preserves oftentimes don't allow you to put anything into trees. You cannot attach stuff to buildings and, 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 and. So uh, bring a variety of antennas and I would recommend antennas that are self-contained and can stand on their own so that you don't have to dig, you don't have to use stakes, you don't have to tie anything to a tree, uh, but you can still operate. Any antenna is a compromise, we know that. But the good news here is, as Susan said earlier, you are the DX, people are trying to work you. So they will try really hard to dig you out of the noise because they want to work that park, they want to add that park to their stats in order to collect these awards. Uh, and that usually means that this compromise that you, your antenna presents will usually not get in the way of getting to those 10 contacts that we need. Any antenna will get a signal out to somewhere. The question just is whether somebody is sitting at that somewhere with a radio and is willing to answer you. Um, when we are working outdoors, then uh, weather, and specifically wind, can get in the way um, of how our antennas uh, stand up or lay down uh, or stay in trees. Um, so we have to sometimes be creative and uh, strap down the antenna to something. If you get your bungees, uh, use your belt or two, as we do here on that picture on the left. We literally used riches in my belt to put that mast up because the way the mast was first positioned didn't work out uh, the way we wanted it. Um, sometimes it's easier to put a mast up with guy lines in the middle of a field. In this case, you would need some stakes or throw a wire into a tree if you can and if you are allowed to. By the way, if you want to learn about how to do that, talk to Rich, KD2UPJ for lessons. He is really good at that. So here is a close-up of those two bells. It worked, we made our contacts. But as you can see, we, we were in sand and I still have sand in all of my gear. Um, be creative when it comes to antennas. Sometimes sand, same place, is preventing you from staking anything down because the stakes just pull out of the sand. Um, in this case, I'm using a drive-on mast holder on the left here. Uh, you don't see the car. And I have a second mast up that's tied to this hammock stand. Um, to get the antenna up. So be creative. Um, there are usually more than one way to mount an antenna and you just need to figure out what works in any given situation. Now, of course, every now and then things go not according to plan. Here on the left, you can see two guys with long poles trying to do an undo a knot in the tree. We were successful, it took a while. Um, the, um, I don't remember whether it was the wire or the line that got caught and knotted itself around uh, a branch, but we were able to undo it. Uh, sometimes your throw line gets tangled up and ends up in the tree. Uh, with the throw bag and everything attached all up there. It happens. Um, and if you're not careful about how you wind up your antenna wire, it may just end up in a big Gordian knot. Uh, it happens and you just have to deal with it, which means packing up takes a little bit longer or setting up takes a little bit longer, but you will be able to make your contacts eventually. So we talked about radios, antennas, 
the other thing we need is power. Now, the good news is the, the PODA program does not have any restrictions about power like the SODA program does. SODA would not allow you to just plug your radio into the wall outlet. Uh, we can do that, but uh, that's usually not an option if we're in the middle of the woods. If we are camping, then yeah, go for it. Uh, if we are at a shelter in a park or a lodge, go for it if you can. But usually what we do is we use either our cars to power our radios or we use a dedicated battery. If you use a battery, hook up a solar panel to it to extend the charge in it or recharge it if you are not using your radio that much. Um, what it comes down again is a compromise. How much weight are you willing to carry around versus how much power do you need? This again might push you towards that QRP radio, but again, be careful with that at the beginning. Make sure that you have a few activations under your belt with a QRO radio so that you, you know how it works. Uh, one thing that is important when it comes to batteries, monitor your battery. Your batteries will last a lot longer if you don't mistreat them and don't uh, discharge them too much or overcharge them. When operating portable, make sure you check your maps and weather reports and all that other good stuff because the POTA entity may require a specific way to operate in a certain way. For example, you're in a very tight spot so you can't use that Wolf River coil with all of its radials, but a, an antenna up in a tree will work or vice versa. You can't put an antenna up in a tree, but you can use your Wolf River. So be prepared before you go. It might be rainy or muggy or buggy, so you, well, yeah, it's always buggy. It might be rainy, so you, if it's rainy and muddy, you're not going to want to sit on the ground like Rich was earlier in a picture. You're going to want to bring a chair and a table for your antenna. So check all your, all the data that you can check before you go out. It will help you. If you are doing a rove of many parks, it might be easier to activate right in your car. Um, don't let the cold weather hold you back. We've got a lot of it. It doesn't stop me. I go play poda all year round, and I do it in my car. Camping is a wonderful way to activate a park. You can take your time playing digital modes, CW, and, a, and SSB for multiple days in a row. Remember, each day is a different activation. If you are camping for three days and you play radio every day and get 10 contacts, that's three activations that you've got. And if you, do it, if you get more than 10 contacts, then you're well on your way to a Kilo Award. Again, with those awards. <laughs> So we talked about, or we briefly mentioned the different ways you can activate, and as Susan said, that the only thing that you cannot do is be on, or Suzanne said, the only thing you cannot do is be on an FM repeater. Anything else works. If that FM repeater happens to be in a low Earth orbit, that's fair game as well. But an Earth-bound repeater uh, is the only thing that we cannot use. Uh, I wanna take a minute here to talk about one specific way uh, one specific mode of operating, and that is CW, because PODA is the perfect way to, uh, to practice your CW skills. I said earlier, PODA is the program that saved ham radio. PODA may as well be the program that saves CW, because we've seen a lot more CW operators um, grow up in the PODA program because they want to hunt more parks. If there's a park out there that I can only get when I do CW, then that's a pretty good incentive to learn it. Um, or if you're an activator and you cannot get your 10 contacts using sideband, then when you switch to CW, all of a sudden it gets a lot easier. So when I was sitting there at the tip of Manhattan Island uh, in the middle of New York City and couldn't get 
my single sideband contacts CW worked. It was still hard, but I got to 10. So, as I said, P uh, PODA is the perfect environment to practice your new CW skills. Why is that? Because the QSO structure is very simple and very formalized. And things are a lot more relaxed as far as speed goes. We do have a few speed demons out there, but most people activating parks are actually at a pretty reasonable speed between, let's say, 13 and 20 words per minute. And all you need to do is learn to copy your call sign at different speeds. And that signal report, which oftentimes is 599, that makes it easy. And then most importantly, learn to recognize the question mark because that's how the activator indicates that they didn't get everything in your call and you need to send it again. So if your call sign starts with a K and you tap out that call sign and then you hear back K question mark, that is an indication for you to send your call sign again. Um, maybe twice, just in case uh, the propagation doesn't work quite as well as you think it does. Then, of course, you need to learn how to send your call sign. And here it doesn't matter how slow you are. There's a pretty good chance the other party, the activator, will wait until you're done and they will copy it. Um, learn to send your state and a signal report. And just send 599 regardless of what the signal report actually is. That's how we all started. Because it's way too complicated to figure out how well do, can I hear this signal? How clear is it? How much noise is there? Just forget about that. Send 599 and be done with it. You can train that skill eventually and then send a 449 or a 229 if you are working really hard to pull that signal out of the noise. And you just made your first POTA CW contact. Um, yes, it is a little bit nerve wracking, but it's much easier to do this within the PODA program than uh, having a full CW QSO where you have to send your name and where you're from and what radio you're using and what antenna you're using. Do it this way. Um, gets a, you, you get done a lot faster and that builds your confidence. And then you can move on to do no, doing other stuff. Now, once you've done that a few times, it's only a little stretch uh, to be, become a CW activator. Again, the, the exchange is simple. It's still the same. But now you need to copy a whole bunch of other call signs, which gets tricky. But again, the question mark is your friend. If you don't copy the full call and you just get the KD at the beginning, just then send that KD question mark and then hope that there's only one KD out there. Uh, but even if there are several of them, you might get just one more letter or one more number and you just do the question mark again and hopefully only one person will come back and you will work that person. Um, the best way to get started as a new activator in CW is to make sure that you're not dealing with a big pileup. Run low power. This is a good reason to run QRP. Use a bad antenna. <laughs> and ideally do this on a day with really, really bad propagation. <laughs> or just pick two of these. Uh, this will make things a lot easier and it will keep your stress, stress level uh, to a much easier to manage level. <clears throat> so give CW a try. Um, the PODA people are really nice people. And as I said, uh, most people don't care about how fast you send. They will actually slow down to your speed and will make it easy on you. So a few years ago, I found this uh, on the PODA Slack channel. Uh, people, this was before we had all those sunspots that we have now. Uh, people were complaining about that the bands were dead. 
and then somebody said, Poda is like magic. You think the bands are dead, and you, you can't see Poda, and all of a sudden the bands open up. Um, you don't know whether the band is dead or not if no, there's nobody out there calling CQ, or if you don't try it and you don't get anybody back. Um, so, again, Poda is the program that saved ham radio because all of a sudden we know that the bands are alive. You just spin that dial and you hear those stations um, pretty much all over the bands. NCW, single side band, FT8, and some of the more exotic digital modes as well. Before we wrap up uh, tonight, we want to tell you about some of our favorite Poda activation stories. Well, as my husband says, the last Poda park I activated was my favorite. But I actually do have a favorite park, and that's K2001, which is the Adirondacks. Uh, I've activated in every single county, and there are 10 counties that are in within the Adirondack Park, the east, the west, the north, the south. We camp up there all the time, and ever since I got my license, we bring that radio, because <laughs> POTA is my thing. Um, last year, we were up there for our anniversary, and it was really, really cold. So Rich went out and got a whole bunch of wood, and made me a fire, and I sat by it all day long. But it started getting dark, and I was getting bored, and I'm like, I really want to play radio, but the radio's way over there at the picnic table, and it's cold over there. Hey, honey, can you bring the radio over here to the fire so that I can play radio and get some photo contacts? And he just looked at me, and he said, yeah, sure, I can do that. And then he brought it over. The coax was long enough. So there you can see me sitting by the fire, drinking my wine, playing radio. And that is the way I like to play Poda. Okay, so we need a pointer for this. So this, this activation was a few years ago, and it was actually before I got my license. So it was pre-pandemic. Um, Carl Heinz and I went down to Florida to visit my parents, and he decided that we were going to Poda in Florida. And we have... In general, when we travel, if we fly somewhere, which isn't very often, it's only carry-on. Like, how are you going to do that? How are you going to do, like, carry-on all of it? Like, they're not even going to let us in. <laughs> but they did. I think they searched the bag, but then they let us go. Not that the first time it just all went. Like, he got, he got an antenna that fit, and it, like, tell, anyway, you'll have to ask him about how we did that, but we did it. So... We just looked for some parks that were in the Fort Lauderdale area. And we had, you know, when you know when you're going to Hamlin, you know what you're doing. You know, when you go to a park in Florida, you have no idea what you're going to come up with. So we thought this sounded like a really cool place, Dr. Von D. Mizell Eula Johnson State Park. And it was right on the ocean. As you can see, Carl Heinz in the middle. Um, right on the ocean. It was an incredibly beautiful spot. We picked a picnic table and I brought my knitting. That is a hat that I was making. My first, you know, multicolor hat, which I lost and recently found. Anyway, I was making my hat. That little critter, he, he was almost as big as me. This was like an iguana, like meeting spot. There were dozens and dozens of iguanas. Some of them, like the small ones, were as big as my arm. That guy was almost as big as my whole body. They're huge, and they're kind of scary looking. So I was on the picnic table, on the picnic table the whole time. Carl Heinz, look at this one. Wait, there's another one. I have like 100 pictures of these guys. And they were like mesmerizing and fascinating and beautiful. And they didn't hurt us. But it was still scary, and I sat right. You can see in that picture, I'm sitting on the picnic table. Anyway, it was just, it was, it was exhilarating and exciting and fun. It's kind of like geocaching. You don't necessarily know where you're going to end up. So when it came time to, for Carl Heinz to teach the class in our house during the pandemic, I thought, well, I think I, think I might want to be involved in this. So that's like my number one. Um, 
I actually brought a QRP station on that trip and um, a telescopic mast that folds down to the size of carry-on luggage. So I can put that into my carry-on bag and bring it on an airplane. And that time, TSA didn't bother me at all. The next time I flew, I actually had two complete radio stations in my backpack. Um, remember that I said I bring two of everything when I travel a long way? Yep, even when, when I do carry-on, I had two complete radio stations in my backpack, one QRO, one QRP. Um, two different antennas, um, two batteries, and that time TSA wanted to look into my bag. Um, and they sw uh, swapped it for explosives and said, it's, it's all good. It's just one crazy amateur radio guy uh, with his stuff. So that second trip actually was what I have here. As soon as I drove up from Florida to New York, um, we needed to bring some stuff up for Susan's parents, and we thought we m would make this trip a little bit more fun by stopping on the way for geocaches and for photo activations. So you see on this map where we activated, and it's on ev in every state with the exception of Florida because we already had Florida and New York. So we already had New York, so we have uh, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. And I planned the trip so that we would stop in real parks, not wildlife management areas or crazy things where you don't really know where you can park. We wanted a real state park with a gate where you drive in and have a parking lot and set up there. They're easy to find. There are signs there that say this state park go five miles this way. So it didn't take us a long time to find them. They were close to the road that we traveled on. And uh, it was planned for every few hours so that we, it would break up our drive. and. Stopping there, um, playing radio, and also finding geocaches, as you can see on this little map here along the route, broke up that trip and made it not boring. We found a lot of interesting sites, like this shot tower here, uh, where they used to make uh, bullets by pouring liquid lead down that tower, and it would fall into a pot or uh, a tub with water at the bottom, and they would fish it out and then use it in their guns. Um, so we, we saw a lot of really interesting places along the way, and again, it made the trip a lot more fun and a lot more manageable. So um, just go out there, give it a try, or turn on your radio at home and hunt some parks. Go to poda.app look up who's out there, pick a frequency that you think you can reach that park in Virginia, North Carolina, uh, Idaho, uh, wherever. If you're working on your work to all states, POTA is a great way to know where to find these states. Set up your alerts for when somebody is in North Dakota or Montana or whatever state you still need and there's a pretty good chance you will get that state eventually through the POTA program. Um, there's one thing we didn't mention, and I'm sorry about that, we forgot about that when we said you have to be in the park, um, everything has to be in the park. There's one more requirement, and you, that is you need to be on public land. You cannot be on private property. So be inside the park and be on public land. When you are in a state park, that's easy to do because the state owns that place. When you are in the Adirondacks, it's a little bit harder to figure out what's private and what's public. Go to a town park that is definitely public property and you are allowed to work from there. Yeah, your private camp that you rent is not or that you own. If you are on a state campground, it is. If you're on a private campground, uh, KOA, then it's not. So that makes the Adirondacks a little bit more challenging, but 
if you just look for town parks and uh, those those signs here that say state land then you're good to go that is it for tonight any questions coordinator for the map are they going to come up with a better way of uh, like lock 32 you mentioned lock 32 that's actually a threefer but I didn't know that at first it wasn't until uh, General, uh, Jeff, who I was out with, told me, oh, yeah, this one counts as three because the Erie Canal literally goes from New York City all the way to Buffalo. Actually, the Erie Canal does not. The Erie, uh, the, the, the Empire State Trail does. The Erie Canal goes from Albany to Buffalo. I thought it went all the way down. But uh, what I mean, though, is there's no good map. Like if you're in a... Uh, and, and there won't be. It's your job to do the research. That's um, a challenge. Yes, it is. But uh, if you can find these spots where you can get a twofer or a threefer or a fourfer, um, it makes you happy. Oh yeah, I mean, so, uh, just uh, like like I mentioned also. The so Scots the problem Post is the problem is um, when you look at the Poda map, every park has only one pin that indicates right. some place within the park. It does not outline where that entity actually is. That is your responsibility to do. Check you the need to you need to go to the states the, the the parks department for example or the DEC look up the map for a certain entity uh, and then say yep um, I see there is a trail that is going through that park let me see if that trail is also a Poda entity the problem again with the trail is it may go from North Dakota to Maine as the North Country Trail does, um, it has only one pin on the map. And if you don't know that the North Country Trail is a Poda thing, you wouldn't know that, for example, in, uh, what is it, Robert H. Robert H. Treeman, uh, there is a spot where you can actually, yeah, can activate both the trail and the park. Yeah, the reason I had asked that was because I had heard from the folks from POTA that they were going to be in, with the next Pershing coming out improving the map that will leave a uh, spot, your spots that you've already activated as a different color and adding more features as far as the trails and everything else. I was wondering if you had heard anything further. Uh, I don't get more information than you do. We have to wait until they actually release that version to see what it looks like. Good. So we can all hope that it will be better, but I doubt that it will actually show three of us on the map. You will, would still have to do your own research to figure out whether you are within the restrictions of the PODA program. For the trail, for example, and this gets a little bit more complicated. For a trail, you have to be within 100 feet of the trail. So when you go to lock 32 and you measure uh, 100 feet from uh, the actual trail, only a part of the parking lot is within that region. And you have to park your car there if you want to operate from your car, or you have to be on one of the picnic tables to be sure that you are the picnic within. picnic table works, correct. Yeah. An ever-increasing number of parks. Is there a process for increasing the number of parks? Um, if you are in another country, then there is, yes. There is a stop on new parks in the US. They did that about two years ago because they wanted to concentrate to grow the program in other countries. So about two years ago, they said, we'll concentrate on growing DX POTA. And because of that, we are all volunteers. We don't have enough people, so we need to put a stop on new parks in the US. The, in the two months before that, there was a mad dash to the finish line, basically. And everybody, every state mapping coordinator put, uh, put
put as many parks, new parks in as they could. In New York State, we added more than 100 new parks in that short time frame. So we now have actually uh, 797 or 798 parks, 797 parks in New York State, and we are the U.S. state with the most parks. So we are in a perfect situation here. We have plenty of parks to work Back when they put that stop on, they said this will last for about two years. So we are past that two-year mark. Uh, again, I don't know any more than you do. All I know is that I have a list that's ready to go once the program opens up again, and then we will get more parks. Right now, the only reason for a new park to be added is if it's a brand spanking new park. New York State, for example, says we are creating a new state park, which they did last year, and I was able to sneak that one in. My Falls is going to be a new state park, but it's going to take a little while longer. <laughs> yeah, that will take a few years, uh, maybe more than a few years, uh, before that actually is a park. They first had, need to clean up the mess that uh, Archie and E left there. Um, so yeah, um, eventually there will be a process again, and if you come across something where you say, this thing looks and feels and smells like it should be a Poda Park, but it's not, you can get in touch with me, I will do the research, and I will either tell you, yeah, this is a great idea, I will try to put this in, or I can tell you, no, we cannot do this because A, B, C. So there are some rules about what parks need to be like in order to be valid poda parks in the U.S. Maybe a high, very high for a yeah. Yes, we, we will be looking for that. Any other questions? Cedric? Would this include county parks? No, only no. state and, and national, national things can be poda parks because we, we already have almost 10,000 parks in the U.S. If we would be adding county parks, you would pr probably be talking about, I don't know, 100,000 different entities, and that is just way too much to handle uh, for this volunteer program. But luckily, in New York, we've got the corridor where there's a lot of county parks in the Erie Area. Canal corridor, so just go to a county park, make sure you're in that corridor, and you can activate case 6532. Uh, I have a question that overlaps with Dave and Cedric's. Um, we talked about twofers and threefers, and I was wondering, you know, you gave some specific examples, and so I was wondering if you could summarize quickly some high level, what are cases where that happens, and then, um, and then the example that you just gave about right. the county parks. So in general, when you have two different PODA entities that overlap, they don't just border on each other, they really overlap. There's an area where you are in one thing and also in the other thing. Then uh, this could potentially be a twofer. If those two entities are managed by different organizations, so if one is a state park, run by the New York State Department of Parks, Recreation, and whatever else it is, um, and the other one is managed by the New York DEC, then it would be a twofer. Or one is in a national park, the other one is a state forest, for example, within that national park, then it would be a twofer. If it's a, a state forest that is within a wildlife management area, it would not be because both of them are managed by the DEC. So that's the legal framework of what a two for a three for and so on is. Um, we have a few of those in the area. We have the Genesee Greenway Trail that runs within the, and now I have to take a deep breath because it's quite a mouthful, the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. And you may have seen those brown signs along uh, the expressways in the area that say entering 
Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. It's a big area um, that goes along the Erie Canal, but it's wide. Uh, so it's, it's not just strictly along the canal. It goes a few miles up, a few miles down, and then it may actually go down to one of the Finger Lakes. So a lot of uh, the things that we have in our area are within this entity. Um, when we talk about Lock 32, we have the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. We have uh, Lock 32 is a state park. And we have the uh, Empire State Trail, which goes along the Erie Canal. So again, there's this 100 feet rule, you have to be within 100 feet of the trail, and then you are in a, tri a threefer. If you are um, on the um, Genesee Greenway, you are um, also potentially in uh, the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor, so that would be a twofer. And there are a few other places when you go a little bit further out, Basically, anything that is on the Empire State Trail between Buffalo and, uh, and Albany is also within the Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor. And there are a few locks that are state parks, so automatic three bus. There was a question over there? No, there was not que no question over there. Don't worry, I have more. Okay. Um, when you're in one of those areas, how on the, I, I understand on the hunter side, there's no effort for the hunter, but on the activator side, do you submit three logs for every contact you make? Yes. Wow, that's a pain. Okay, cool. That was a short answer. <laughs> um, I can keep going. I'll keep you here all night long, but I'll, I'll try and be fast. Um, you mentioned, or actually you didn't mention, but I've heard this and I wanted to hear from you. Sometimes I hear either in cases where I've been a hunter or just um, tuning around the bands, I hear, please hold for the second operator. Whoa. That's me. <laughs> I'm the second operator. Or the, third. or the third or the fourth. When Rich is, when we're all together, there's four operators. So for the hunter, the hunter gets four contacts. So it's not as exciting. It, it's, it's really for the hunter. The hunter then just gets four. And um, maybe you want to say more, but that's me. I'm the second operator. When there are four operators at a threefer, there's, <laughs> there's a huge pileup of park to parks <laughs> because you can activate your park with basically getting the four of us. Oh, park to park. Um, if you're in a park and you're activating and you're decided to hunt because you're done activating for a while, you've got 50 contacts and you just want to hunt. You contact me, you see me on the spot, I'm in a park, contact me, we do a little QSO and we got a park to park and there's a special award for that, believe it or not. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I take the park-to-parks over other people. I take park-to-parks first, wild, and then, sorry, guys. <laughs> I also ask for QRP stations, and then I ask for people volunteering for the PODA program. They also get first tips. And sometimes when they're, we're trying to break into a pileup, if Suzanne or I call in, they talk to us. <laughs> they're like... Yeah, we got enough of them, but people want the people want to talk to us. Next, are you done? Did we get through it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one. Well, it wasn't me before, but I'm just wondering, with all the different entities in New York, are there any that haven't been activated yet? One. Which one? Uh, There's one. Um, so actually, um, it's an island. It's in the middle of Niagara River, approaching the Niagara Falls. And, 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 and if that is not complicated enough or uh, dangerous enough, you have to be a duck hunter. 
and you have to be invited to be on that island to hunt ducks. And then you can activate the Poda Park. So that is the only Poda Park that has not been activated in New York State. Michael, Mike, guys, get your boat out there. I was going to say that the permits for that, that park are issued on a lot of things. So not only do you need um, a boat and, and a set of brass ones, but like <laughs> you need to hit the lottery to go. Yeah. Uh, but, but if you do, uh, I'll be like on the shore with a tri-band. I'll work you on three bands. <laughs> I think we have a plan here. A any duck hunters here? Uh, Suzanne brought some fantastic gear. Do you want to just say briefly what you've got? So when we're all done, if anybody wants to just come up and visit the equipment, you can do that while, we're, while everybody's packing up. It's my camping FT8 portable setup. So if you want to see how I do it when I'm camping, uh, I got it all here. I, my batteries do vary because we, 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 we do what's called dispersed camping or boondocking, where we don't use electricity hookups. So we do everything off of battery and solar. Um, and I have a medium-sized battery for the radio that I use uh, for FT8, um, but we do have lots of other batteries that I did not bring, so. Have yes. you ever been told by a park ranger that you needed a permit to set up your station? I have. I've been talked to by park rangers and asked what I've been doing and I show them my license and give them a brochure for POTA. Um, nobody's ever asked me personally to have a permit to do what I'm doing. And in general, we are on public property. We are paying taxes. Um, and unless you say you are broadcasting, which we all know we are not doing, uh, they really don't have any reason to stop you. Monica, question on the test. You are not broadcasting. He taught me that in my technician class. We are not broadcasting. Don't say that, because we're not. Um, yeah, we, we also have been talked to by park rangers and park police a few times, usually because somebody is reporting suspicious activity like that 30-foot fishing pole that I'm putting up in the middle of the woods, no water in sight, very suspicious. Anything else? Then come here and see Suzanne's FT8 station. Uh, and again, go out, activate a park, go home, work a few parks and just participate in POTA. It is a lot of fun. It is the activity that's saving ham radio. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Uh, come up, take a look, and otherwise, have a great night and weekend, and we will see you next month for the auction. <laughs>